So our final section is uh, potpourri. So this yeah. is an assortment of questions that our readers have proposed, uh, various different topic areas. Um, first is about hours of operation. Um, it, we get the question, uh, you know, why is there no bus that I could take to my early shift? At the other end, we get uh, the question, why do you stop before the bars close? And, uh, and why doesn't the red line have the same operating hours as the airport? Um, so let me just, I've actually had a number of conversations recently about people about asking about particularly the bus hours of operation. And, you know, I was talking to one of our customers uh, recently on a phone call I did, which was, um, you know, how come I can't get from Division to North Portland where I live uh, at 1.30 at night? Mm -hmm. And so we actually are looking at that to see whether or not there's some additional service we should add on Friday and Saturday nights just to accommodate on some of the lines that really serve areas that have a, you know, a lot of restaurants or bars and, and, and social uh, opportunities. So the other thing, I guess, is that you know, our light rail system does run until about 1.30. So we do provide, if you're downtown, we do provide that kind of connection via the light rail system. So I think there are some things we can do and we want to look at. I would just caution and remind everybody that an hour of bus service at, um, a 1.30 at night costs the same to us as an hour of bus service during the PM peak hour. And so we have to be pretty cautious about where we put those hours of bus service. While we want to provide a complete uh, panoply of service, we also know that uh, we have lots of needs during the peak hours too. So we've got to balance that as we look at the system overall. Related to the airport, right now um, we're, we're operating all but about five hours uh, in a 24 hour period. So we're operating 19 hours a day. And the five hours are really, to us, the, the, what, what is needed for the maintenance activities that occur on the line. Um, but it is something we, we continue to hear about and we'll continue to look at. One of the just, well, it's not related specifically to the hours of the airport service, uh, one of the ideas that has come out of the West Side Service Enhancement Plan is to do a switch between the red line and the blue line so that the red line would provide direct service to the airport all the way to Hillsboro as sort of a steady base, uh, as the base service. Um, and then the blue line would end in Beaverton, although frankly even now we're going to need to begin to extend the blue line further out in years ahead, uh, or the red line further out in years ahead whatever the case may be because of the growing loads in Washington County. Uh, so that's something we want to do some additional customer surveys with over the next year and then uh, that may be something we can implement fairly soon which would provide that direct connect airport connection to those in Washington County. The other consideration really related to service to the airport, the timeline, is you know if the airport line is the only line running the rest of the system's not there to support it, mm -hmm. and so the customer base would not be as long. Now, maybe people can be dropped off, but that's a, that's a different consideration as well. Okay. Uh, so I'll bet the next question came from me. Um, we've recently had a, uh, a deep discussion in Portland about parking in large apartment buildings, and yep. particularly on frequent transit corridors. Um, and what we could debate whether the parking is a good idea or a bad idea, what the right minimum is, I, I won't take you there. But there was an interesting sub-choice in that about um, which transit lines that should uh, apply to. The, the, the current Portland standard and the one city council chose to keep is uh, any place where we have 20 minute peak hour service. Mm -hmm. uh, the proposal that came out of planning commission was to just make the, that parking reduction available on the frequent service lines. Do you have a sense of uh, which of, if either of those might be the more appropriate standard? So do I want to pick a fight with the planning commission or the city council? Right. <laughs> Keep in mind you're sitting across from a planning commission. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first thing I'd say, and this is, this is like the, the 20,000 foot observation is, wow, that we can have this argument. Because when I started uh, with the West Side Light Rail Project, 22 years ago at TriMet, there was a wonder whether or not we could get banks to finance any kind of transit-oriented development, let alone uh, some reduced parking level. And the, the reduced parking levels they were talking about at that time was one and a half to maybe one and a quarter, to maybe one parking space <laughs> per unit. And look where we are, where now banks are anxious to finance zero parking uh, developments. Um, so we've, we've 
made a lot of progress in this city, and I think you have to sort of take this debate, this conversation, and sort of go up 20,000 feet and say, we, this is great success, first of all. This is how to manage the success uh, of our transit and land use program overall. So what I would tell you is I think um, that, you know, if you begin to include streetcar and uh, the frequent service lines and, and, and the max lines, there's a lot of territory as you start looking at that, which is in, within that frequent service net, if you will, including mm -hmm. those other rail alternatives. And I, I think those are clearly the highest, um, highest and best use. So in those, in those cases, I think the lower parking ratios really should apply. Um, I think one of the things we sitting to challenge a planning commissioner um, that we need to really do is not just think about what the what the um, frequent service lines are today, but what will they be in 10 and 20 years, and then begin to apply that same standard to those lines as well. So I don't know that there is a magical cutoff. I know I'm kind of evading the answer, but I think one of the things our planners have told me, and I'm not perfectly familiar with this, but that, for example, the city of Seattle has done a really remarkable job of laying out the future transit corridors and defining very, uh, in very straightforward terms, the hierarchy of uses along that in terms of the use of the road space uh, and the priority for transit. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I think we could be stronger at in Portland. Um, and that might help that, that, right. that debate. So let me reframe the question in a way that doesn't make you pick sides. Um, <laughs> you know, our goal obviously is to have a rich set of choices, whether that's using transit or a bicycle or yes. a car share or yes. you know, even having lots of things within easy pedestrian distance. Um, how frequent do you think transit has to be to support a, a no car or low car lifestyle in, in an urban setting? Well, that's a great question. And I think it should be a minimum 15 minute Headway. So I, that's sort of been our standard. I think that actually works pretty well. 15-minute uh, headways can generally be managed to be really, truly increments. Many corridors probably could grow above that when you begin to think about it to 12 or 10-minute frequencies on an all-day basis. But I think when you start thinking about, and again, again, providing a variety of choices, 15 minutes is a pretty good, pretty good number. Uh, so to to take another avenue on the parking question. Um, if we were to use your frequent service quarter uh, designation as a threshold for, for land use decisions, uh, do you anticipate that, um, one, would it change the way developers think about TriMet, or flip side, would it change the way that neighborhoods think about TriMet as uh, you know, maybe some positive things along with some negative things? Or, or what's your perspective on that? Well, I think, I think there is, uh, I think there, Frankly, I think most neighborhoods would really be pleased to get more transit service, and particularly the Portland neighborhoods. But again, like I said earlier, we're seeing that same response, whether it's in Clackamas County or Washington County, where more frequent bus service is not seen as a negative. It's seen as a huge positive for, neighbor, for neighborhoods. I think that, that that will wash over any long-term land use designations, and I think related to land use and development questions, uh, that will continue to be the Planning Commission and the City Council's uh, domain, not TriMet's. And I'll put uh, in a plug that, you know, thinking about where the next frequent service quarter should be is an excellent topic for the comprehensive plan review that Portland's yes. going through, and right. the next major round of public input on that will be the end of the summer, so we hope that our, our listeners are paying attention to that opportunity. That's good. Uh, so shifting to our next question, uh, several readers have asked about whether there are opportunities to streamline operations through the switches at the east end of the steel bridge, which is a big bottleneck within the light rail system. Um, I don't think anything near term, although in the next year, we are programming the funds to do what we call the replacement of the lift joints right now. The trains uh, cross the bridge at, I think it's about five miles per hour, uh, pretty slow. Um, and that's because the lift joint, the joints that occur where the left span goes up are worn. And if we go faster, we could do damage to the train or lift damage to the lift spans on the at the joints on the bridge. So those are due to re be replaced this year. So warning, there will be some service uh, mm -hmm. interruptions for a short period of time as we do that. Um, so I think that's number one, and that will raise the speed up to about 15. And so that should clear more trains off the bridge uh, in a, 
in a more timely way, which I think should help unplug some of the occasional congestion we get. That said, we're, we are putting an awful lot of trains through there, um, and uh, it is one of our operations tight spots, and so I know people have to be a little patient occasionally, but I think this improvement that we've got next year um, is, uh, is a, will really help that. Long term, one of the things we want to look at is whether or not the second set of tracks begins to make sense, that begins to, if you will, unweave the spaghetti a little bit mm. by provide some other alternatives, and so that would be in, on the outside lanes of the steel bridge. Um, and, and how that would work, or if that's even feasible, and if the bridge is strong enough to carry it. would be mixed operation it. with traffic? I think it would be mixed mm -hmm. operation with traffic, much as you might remember I do. Certainly, um, those center lanes weren't always transit only lanes. We right. had the ability to advance the trains uh, ahead of traffic, and the traffic could follow. And so, mm -hmm. those are the kinds of considerations you mm -hmm. could look at in the future. But a lot of questions need to be mm -hmm. answered about that, so I'm not proposing that, but okay. it's. Um, I think that's one of the things we want to look at very carefully. I would just also say um, that the steel bridge is one of the uh, pieces of our system that I stare at a lot in terms of both its longevity and its uh, safety in terms of earthquake standards. That's something the region needs to turn its attention to in the long run as well. Uh, so our next question is about uh, bus stops. What's the, uh, the progress of the bus stop improvement plan in terms of getting to all parts of the network? My understanding, and I haven't gotten a specific, but I think we're about done with getting the bus stop, the, the blue poles and the, and the new signs. Mm -hmm. um, now, actually, one of the things we're going back through is making sure, for example, QR codes are at on mm -hmm. all, all the stops. And some of the, the, the stop lines, like the line I ride, the 43, was the first line to have the QR codes, and now we've got to go back. Mm -hmm. and, put some new information out so that those are available at every bus stop. So that'll be an interesting innovation again, I think, on our part. Um, I think the question was more motivated by shelters and lighting than it was about the blue signs. Okay, uh, sorry, thank you. And shelters, remember, we have now really, since I've been at TriMet, we've probably tripled or quadrupled the number of shelters. Now that said, that's probably one of the complaints I hear the most about, why can't we put have more shelters? So our current standard is about 100 boarding rides per day uh -huh. uh, for a shelter. And again, we have excellent data about how many people get on and off at every stop. So we can, we can then prioritize based on the use uh -huh. of that stop. And then we put sort of factor in special characteristics. So for example, are there a lot of lift deployments going on that might indicate that somebody in a mobility device um, you know, is using the stop that might indicate um, the need for a shelter more than the numbers would otherwise indicate. But more than the shelters, I would note that one of the big pushes we have underway right now and getting good traction with our regional partners is additional access to transit, mm -hmm. which is in the form of sidewalks, bus stop improvements, mm -hmm. um, and um, cycling improvements as well. So an example of that in East Portland is the East Portland in Motion work. We were able to secure an MTIP uh, funding of about $8.1 million, which is a lot of money when it comes to sidewalks um, for, uh, for that area. We also have improvements going on. Washington County is improving the sidewalks along Cornell, where we established a new through route between the Sunset Transit Center and Hillsboro Transit Center um, in Washington County. So, and we also have a number of STEP applications in state and transportation improvement program um, with ODOT that include safe crossings and sidewalk improvements. So this is an area that I think is getting a lot of attention from those owners of the roads we run on. Um, and I think it's important, it is really beginning to grow and uh, its need is becoming much more evident as people like me continue to age and want to access the transit system in a safe way. Uh, so you mentioned safety and then reliability as your key priorities. Um, some of our readers have noticed that uh, reliability has had some challenges lately, a lot of max service disruptions. Um, is there any issue of having the right mix of resources to be able to address operations and reliability versus, say, capital planning or other competing demands for resources? Well, it's a constant balancing act, but one thing that I would tell you is, and I've mentioned this in our budget presentations uh, to many groups uh, over the last couple of months, 
is that the federal government created the State of Good Repair program mm -hmm. just in time for Portland um, because our original MAX line parts of it are now approaching 30 years old, including our vehicles. And as you know, many of our Type 1 vehicles have gone through a rehabilitation. The interesting thing is that our Type 2 vehicles are now needing to go through some rehabilitation or being queued up for that. So um, that state of good repair funding from the federal government, which is siloed and dedicated to that purpose, will allow us to address some of these needs. And I'll give you just a few examples. One I gave earlier, which was the steel bridge lift joint repair. The other is that there is a, a, a hodgepodge of pavement and, and switches at 11th and Holiday that need to be mm -hmm. repaired. We've actually had some deterioration of the ground underneath it, and so it needs to be redone. Um, and we have a number of other areas along the alignment that, um, including some places where even the, the platform pavement is not performing well. One example of that is actually at the Sunset Transit Center, where we're actually seeing some of the pavers starting to slide into the right of way if we don't get, get our handle on it. So there are a number of places, and, and this next budget, I think the really good news about it is that it does allow us to restore uh, a little bit of service, but fix a lot of service problems, and that's the 2.1 million you mentioned. But it also, with the State of Good Repair program and TriMet Capital, allow us to begin to address some of those uh, infrastructure needs. Um, some of it is max infrastructure, some of it is vehicle infrastructure, replacement, advanced replacement of buses. Those kinds of act, uh, investments were not made uh, and were deferred during the worst part of the Great Recession. And so we have a little catching up to do, and this budget is allowing us to begin that process. Okay. Our final question is about colors. Uh, it's been <clears throat> announced that the Portland-Milwaukee light rail line will be designated as the orange line, but it's likely to interline with either the green and or the yellow. Uh, and the question is, if it's interlining, why does this need its own color, and won't the color change as the vehicle progresses through the system be confusing to riders? Well, um, to be honest with you, we're just beginning that, that process, so we have a lot of work to do related to that question. But when we think about the colors of lines and how to organize them, we're not thinking about just the opening of Portland, Milwaukee. We're thinking about the long term. So we're thinking about what happens when CRC comes on play. What if there's any other radial corridors at some point in time in the system, and how do they all begin to work together? Uh, and how do we balance those lines efficiently so that we have nicely uh, length, uh, nice length of uh, runs for operators with good opportunities for breaks and, and rest facilities at either end? So um, you piece all that together, what you see is an imbalance of demand, I think actually more demand coming from the south than from the north, coming into downtown. So our intention right now is that um, most, if not, uh, uh, certainly most of the Yellow Line trains will through route uh, to Milwaukee. And so that will be a continuous movement. But some of the Milwaukee trains, uh, as, uh, on at least the opening period, will need to turn around at the north terminal and actually loop back uh, because there is a need for that capacity during the peak hours uh, heading north, at least until the CRC is open. And so then that may be an, another point where we, um, where we look at that, those designations a, a bit more. So it's a little bit of a complicated story, and as I noted, uh, stay tuned. Uh, that might be something you want to ask me next year again, and we'll know a lot more as we work through it uh, with the actual more uh, fine-tuned uh, demand as estimates associated with the opening of the line. Okay. Well, Neil, on behalf of our readers, I'd like to thank you for your time today. Well, thank you. It's been fun.